Let's go to our preaching time for today. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4. 2 Timothy, chapter 4. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 8, if you're taking notes. 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Paul writes, I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts, shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course. I have kept the race, excuse me, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. This chapter of 2 Timothy records the last words of the Apostle Paul. Last words are sometimes very significant. And he's getting ready to lose his life at the hands of the Roman government. And he, this is his challenge here in verse 1 to his disciple Timothy to continue the work which he had begun. To continue the ministry as he had been executing it. To carry on in his place. When a Bible preacher is ordained, it's very common for the, one of the older ministers to read this section of the Bible, uh, and it's, it's uh, referred to as the ministerial charge to the new preacher, and it's a reminder to the young man of what he's supposed to do with the Bible. He's supposed to preach the Word. He's not to get sidetracked and sidelined and uh, distracted with things of this world, things that everybody else thinks are so critical and vital and important. Global warming. Since it wasn't warming, they had to change the language, and now they call it climate change. 30 years ago, they were predicting global freezing. They don't know what's going to happen. Uh, they know about as much as you know, or you know as much as they know. You know good and well that it's beginning to be wintertime. After that, it'll get a little bit nicer, springtime, and then summer again. That much is going to happen. But as far as that goes, you and I know as much as the climate scientists do. They don't know any more than that. Everything's theoretical. Uh, social justice, whatever that is. Justice is justice. You don't qualify it saying social justice, meaning the poor people should, should enjoy all the benefits and privileges of free this, free that, free something else uh, without having to work for it or earn it uh, at the expense of those who did. It used to be if you couldn't afford something, you didn't get to have it yet. Now, you just, just give it to them anyway. We'll just overtax the people who have been productive, and we'll give all these things, whether it's a, a cheap cell phone or a cheap um, cable and TV contract to people who can't afford it uh, at the expense of those who can, we'll overcharge them. This is what they're doing. You get your Obama phone, you get your Obama cell self-service, you get your Obama internet and high-speed internet, you get your Obama this, that, or the other. Obama was a real piece of work, let me put it that way. But the preacher's not supposed to be distracted with things of that nature. Uh, he shouldn't worry about all of those sideline things because the time would come when the people themselves would start to drift away from the Word of God, and they'd be mesmerized and pulled in other directions towards things of the world rather than things of God. 
The preacher's job is to try to influence his flock to be a blessing to them and steer them back to a love and a devotion for Jesus Christ and the Word of God while he can, if he can. That's his job. And his parting words to Timothy, Paul reveals five things about the Christian life that every preacher, young or old, and really every Christian, uh, young or old, man or woman, should keep in mind. So I call this sermon, Five Pictures of the Christian Life. Five Pictures of the Christian Life. And they're all going to be drawn from verses 6 and 7 in our text. First of all, let me say the Christian life is an altar. Paul says, verse 6, For I am ready to be offered. The, the sum total, the totality of his life as a preacher, as an evangelist, as a missionary, as a teacher of New Testament doctrine, of an establisher of New Testament churches, of church discipline, of instruction to men and women in the Christian home and the Christian marriage, and uh, so many other things that we owe to the Apostle Paul for teaching us. His suffering on behalf of the saints, his suffering instead of the saints, uh, for, the sake, for the name of Jesus Christ, his scourgings and his imprisonments, his shipwreck, and all of those things that he endured for the service of Jesus Christ, all of that would soon be laid at the feet of Jesus Christ as an offering of his life. Would it measure up to gold, silver, precious stones, or would they be counted as wood, hay, and stubble, according to 1 Corinthians 3, verse 12? It's been said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Everything else will fall away, fall by the wayside. Only those things you do for the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ will endure into eternity. It's amazing how much time Christians can waste with things that aren't vital, things that aren't essential, things that aren't important in the big picture of eternity. And then we waste a lot of time with them. The Apostle Paul wrote, But as he which hath, um, uh, not Paul, but Peter, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. 1 Peter 1, verse 15. God wants so much more from you than the little bit you might give him. Sometimes people don't give him anything. I got my salvation. That's the most important thing. It doesn't matter what I do after that. It does matter. Amen. You don't want to be caught at the judgment seat of Christ with no rewards, no blessing on top of your salvation. When other Christians who might have been going through harder times than you were, they might have been suffering more difficulties than you've ever suffered, still glorified Jesus Christ. They honored the Savior. They were true to the Word of God. They cared about lost people coming to Jesus Christ. They were... Uh, powerful in prayer and didn't give up talking to God and asking God for things in prayer and they were able to see God answer their prayers. They didn't give up and they had rougher lives than you have and yet you have a good life and you still don't live for them. Amen. Paul wrote, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Romans 12, verse 1. It's not unreasonable of God to ask you to do something for Jesus' honor by living a clean and a virtuous and a pure and a moral life in thought, word, and deed. Long ago, King David prayed, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Psalm 19, verse 14. There's nothing more pitiful than a Christian who is known for having dirty thoughts and a dirty mouth. You don't want that kind of reputation. Peter writes, Ye also as lively stones are built a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, verse 5. One of the most wonderful doctrines in the New Testament has to be the doctrine of the priesthood of the believer. You don't need to go to a religious priest in a special Amen. clothing to go between you and God, God, to approach God on your behalf. You go straight to him now. 
Your high priest died for your sake. He offered his own life as the payment for your sin. He opened the way between you and the Heavenly Father. You don't need a priest any longer. You possess the priesthood of Jesus Christ. So now you offer him sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving and gratitude for all that you have by the new birth, by the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us an example of this. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Giving praise, giving thanks, being grateful for everything you have as a believer. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. We sometimes say, well, when good things happen to me, I'll be sure to thank God for. The truth is, good things happen, you still don't thank God. But Paul goes beyond that, Ephesians 5.20 says, giving thanks always for all things, in the name of the Father, uh, uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ. You're supposed to thank Him for good things, for bad things, pleasant things, unpleasant things, sickness, health. You're supposed to thank Him for all of it. Last week was our Thanksgiving here in America. How thankful for you, were you for everything you have? I don't mean, I don't just mean as a, someone living in the United States. There's plenty to be thankful for there. But are you thankful for challenges that come to you? Were you thankful for any sickness you had to go through? Were you thankful? Were you thankful for any loved one who passed away? Were you thankful for the fact that they're no longer enduring what they had to endure here? If they were sick, if they were saved, are you thankful that they're in heaven? Sure. What if they weren't saved? You're still supposed to be thankful that, they're, that they've passed. Say, how do I wrap my mind around that? You better get your nose in the Bible, spend time with God, and learn how to be thankful. You know something? When you're thankful for trials and hardships, it causes you to trust God even more. You're forced to draw close to Him and be yielded to Him and ask for everything that, that He can possibly give as a measure of comfort and a way to help you endure this challenge and leap over this hurdle because there's going to be another one coming. You have to be thankful for everything. It puts a lot of things into perspective. Be thankful that you for problems that you don't have, that other people may have. And when you're thankful, that's a sacrifice. And only you can offer that sacrifice. You offer it on the altar of your life. But the Christian life is an altar. Secondly, let me say the Christian life is a pilgrimage. Paul says in verse 6, the time of my departure is at hand. The years of your life from birth until death are sometimes referred to as your pilgrimage or the journey of your life. And for anybody that saw Lord of the Rings, you know Gandalf said, the gray pilgrim. That's what they used to call me. The important question for people to ask is, do I know where I'm going when my pilgrimage, when my journey is over? The great chapter on faith in the New Testament, the lives of Old Testament saints tell us, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Hebrews 11, verse 13. The Old Testament characters who died before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, nevertheless, had a good pilgrimage if they followed God with the light he gave them at the time. How much more wonderful should the life of a New Testament believer be? You've got the Holy Spirit living inside your body. You have a complete Bible you hold in your hands. You can read in your own language. Those of you who are bilingual, you read it in two languages. And the, I, the promise of eternal security that Christ said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. He lives inside of you for sure, for certain, and forever. Amen. Thank God for that. Amen. The opposite of eternal security has to be eternal insecurity. 
Maybe I had it. Maybe I lost it. Maybe I didn't have all of it. Maybe I have to speak in tongues to get more of it. But the life of a Christian should be a wonderful life and a wonderful journey, a wonderful pilgrimage. The time between when you get saved and the time you die and go to heaven, that's your Christian pilgrimage. Think of a pilgrim as one who's traveling somewhere. That pilgrim, pilgrimage, that journey may sometimes be filled with uh, uphill climbs and mountains to climb and problems to endure and, and trials to go through. Pharaoh asked Jacob, How old art thou? Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are an hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have the days of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. Genesis 47, verse 9. How sad he, it was for him to admit that. I'm 130 years old, and my life, my accomplishments, my achievements don't measure up to the lives of my father Isaac, my grandfather uh, Abraham, before me. Will your Christian pilgrimage one day be one in which you spent it in prayer, in learning the Word of God, and rightly dividing proper doctrines in the Word of God so you, can, so you can grow closer to Jesus Christ, and depending on the Holy Spirit to lead and direct your thinking, will it be a life that, in which you spent with the, in the company of other brothers and sisters in Christ who believed in those same things? You trusted God by prayer to save save lost people, and God saved them, and you could rejoice when those blessings would come. You saw answers to prayer in this area and that area. Or will it be a pilgrimage in which you spend it in rehab, in AA, uh, in the hospital, in jail, or some other, or a divorce court? Paul reminds the Corinthians, I have not seen nor ear heard Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. But the Christian life is a pilgrimage. Thirdly, let me say this. The third picture of the Christian life is this. The Christian life is a battle. He says in verse 7, I have fought a good fight. If there's one thing the Apostle Paul knew and understood, it is that the Christian life is a battle. It really is. It's not smooth sailing all the time where no problems arise. As soon as you have a blessing from God, watch out. Buckle up, baby, because there's a challenge coming to you right around the corner. How many of you, and the camera won't pick this up, but raise your hand if you enjoy the great preaching and the blessing you get at our church summer camp every year. Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you know that as soon as you go back home, the very next week, there's going to be some challenge to you, some challenge to your Christian life and your testimony, some friend at school, somebody at work that tries to drag you back into their dirty talk and their worldly conversation, and you stop reading your Bible like you started at camp. He says, I'm going to start reading my Bible once again. And then you get home, you stop doing it. How many of you realize that that happens every year? Because once you get to the mountaintop, there's another valley to go through after that. You can't stay on the mountaintop all the time. So the Christian life is a battle. It's a challenge. He told Timothy in chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him, who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You don't want to get sidetracked with the distractions of the world, things that are transitory and temporary that aren't going to last. They'll have no fruit to bring to you in eternity, for eternity's sake. Only those things you do for the honor and the glory of Jesus Christ and to draw closer to him, to be a true disciple of him, will endure. Everything else is going to burn up. He wrote in his first letter, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them bindest war a good warfare. 1 Timothy 1, verse 18. The Bible is filled with military themes, military exploits, descriptions of battle and a combat strategy. And it's one of the strongest images in the Bible to uh, illustrate the Christian life. 
Paul told the Ephesians to, quote, put on the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6, 11. He said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Then he lists the armor that a Christian soldier should be uh, outfitted with. His loins be girt about with truth. Loins, girt, what does that mean? Well, it means to tighten your belt so your pants don't fall down. That's about the simplest way I can illustrate it. To have on the breastplate of righteousness. Your righteousness is not made up of your own goodness. It's made up of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's completely impenetrable. No fiery dart of the wicked ever get through that breastplate of righteousness. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. When you go somewhere, or if you're on a street corner, if you're knocking on doors, you go to work, you go to school, you talk to somebody at the supermarket. When you go somewhere and you try to talk to them about Jesus Christ, you're not going there to create an enemy. You're going there to hopefully bring peace, to reconcile them to God. They may or they may not appreciate it. But you're not going there for the purpose of making them mad and making an enemy. You're going there to offer them some hope, to show them that we've all sinned, yet God made a way for us to be brought back to God. Having the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, he says, which is the word of God. That's the weaponry. And then he adds, Praying always with all prayer and supplication. To supplicate means to beg God humbly. Without constant prayer, your Christian warfare will fail. It won't succeed. He said, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 and 4. If someone mocks the Lord Jesus Christ, they mock the Bible, they insult you as a Christian, they want to make fun of the Lord Jesus Christ when you offer them a tract or talk to them about salvation, your first instinct shouldn't be, I want to kill that guy. That might be your second instinct, but your first instinct should be to talk to God and ask God to move and get involved in the situation. Maybe you can change the heart of that man or that woman, change the circumstances so that they're more receptive, more willing to receive your testimony, receive a track, receive an invitation to church or come hear the preaching. We hear these stories of soldiers that have been deployed. They've been gone for some time, and meanwhile their wife and children are at home, they're gone 9, 10 months, 11 months. And by, you know, they see each other by face talking on the phone, but it's not quite the same as being there in person. And we've seen those reunion videos, uh, which are always very touching. And, uh, you know, the wife might have had another child that the husband hasn't seen yet. Um, now he's, he, he finally returns, the kid's six months old, and uh, it's just a wonderful reunion. And that's what you want with Jesus Christ. My father wrote these words about 50 years ago in a song. Let's see if I can do it justice. There's a land that the Bible calls heaven, the abode of the faithful and blessed. And when my journey is ended, I shall enter that haven of rest. I'm like a traveler who is far from his country, like a soldier who has gone off to war. My soul awaits with great longing just to walk through my father's door. I'm going home someday. I'm going home someday. And no more this darksome road will I roam. I'll be with Jesus there, eternal blessings we'll share in my heavenly home, sweet home. Amen. I also like that word my dad threw in there, darksome. It's not found in current dictionaries. It's an old English word. It means cloudy, obscure. That's how life can be. But not when you get to be with Jesus Christ. 
You're looking forward to that kind of reunion with the Savior. But the Christian life can be a battle. Let me say next that the Christian life is a race. Paul says, verse 7, I have finished my course. The image of the, the Bible gives is not a Roman chariot race to see who comes in first, but it's like a track and field race uh, a, or a long distance a marathon runner to make sure you succeed and finish all the way. Don't give up halfway there. God's spiritual purposes, he instructs us how to compete in the race of the Christian life. Hebrews 12, verse 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, those would be Old Testament saints, those would be New Testament saints who have died before you've died, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Paul also wrote, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24. If you enter the L.A. Marathon, uh, or the Boston Marathon, New York Marathon, with 10,000 other people, you all know that only one person is going to cross the finish line first. But you train just in case. Even if you know you're not going to finish the, cross the finish line first, you don't want to quit halfway through. You want to at least finish it and finish what you started, finish what you trained for, finish what you had committed yourself to do and said you were going to do. You told everybody at work you were going to do it. You told everyone at school you signed up and you were going to do it. You want to finish. And you don't want to be penalized for cheating somewhere along the way, you know. You're, you're heading down a, an, an avenue that's been roped off for the marathon, and then you take a shortcut through an alleyway so you can come out on another street and be in front of the line. Then, you know, you don't want to do that. <laughs> William Carey, the great missionary to inland China, 1840s and 50s, he said, Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. That's powerful advice. Attempt great things for God. A lot of people have attempted great things in the name of God, but not for the glory and the honor of God. They used God, they used church, they used their denomination, their religion, as a way of milking donations from rich people who might contribute to their cause, but not for the glory of Jesus Christ. Sometimes the Christian race uh, is likened to a rat race. Sometimes it's like an obstacle course. All kinds of things to steer clear of and avoid. As you run in the lane, God has put you on the track. You do the best you can. Be as diligent as you can with whatever talents and whatever um, skill and time you possess with His help so that it's not to see who finishes first the thief on the cross already finished before the rest of us. <laughs> but it's to see that everyone finishes well. You don't want any blotches or marks on your Christian record that would bring, bring shame to all other believers by association. Paul asks, or added, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, Hebrews 12. Verse 2, Jesus Christ will be waiting for you at the finish line. When you get there, you want to finish well. But the Christian life is a race. And lastly, let me say this. The Christian life is a trust. Paul says in verse 7, I have kept the faith. Something has been entrusted to you for safekeeping, to protect. The Bible says, but as we are allowed of God... Excuse me, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth the hearts. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. Every preacher and every Christian should understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, to understand its power to save a lost soul that's on its way to hell and can steer it now on its way to heaven. Everyone should understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. It does not include church membership. It does not require water baptism. And a Christian should understand that it's powerful enough to save and wash clean the soul that's stained with its own sin by the power of Jesus Christ and the forgiving power of the Holy Spirit. And he should be able to convey it to somebody else in simplicity and purity. Don't corrupt it with things like, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and make sure you get back. No, no, no. And make sure you give money to, no, no, don't do that. And make sure you support TV. By all means, don't do that, right? <laughs> How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4.15 for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verse 23. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, verse 8. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6, verse 23. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 4, verse 10. He was a satisfactory substitute for your sake, dying on your behalf. The Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. They believe they'll be saved too. Acts 16, verse 31. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. This is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Amen. Lastly, the Apostle Paul told Timothy it was the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. 1 Timothy 1, verse 11. It's been entrusted to you, Christian. You don't want to fail God in the way you execute it, the way you convey it to some sinner who needs to hear it. The Christian life is an altar. It's seen as a pilgrimage. It's a battle. It's a race. And it's a sacred trust. And he finishes his thoughts in verse 8. Henceforth, or from now on, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Centuries have passed since the Lord Jesus Christ died and was buried and rose again from the dead for the sake of sinners. But the charge remains the same, to be faithful to the gospel uh, in Paul's stead until Jesus Christ comes and calls us home to heaven. 